I had the opportunity recently to do a TV show with um, a TV segment with David Pogue, and his so his teenage son happened to be there. And his teenage son spent a very long time trying to convince me that Russian roulette was a really good thing to do. And he was arguing from the numbers. Um, and I say that in part because I wanted to let you know, I know, it was hysterical. I, the guy was so funny, uh, but really believed it. He really thought he should, yeah, I'm not playing Russian roulette. <laughs> um, uh, I say that in part to say that the stuff that I'm going to talk about now is based on research that's done with, with adults. There's actually been very little research that's been done with adolescents with respect to how to present information. Um, so I just wanted to kind of mention that at, at the outset. What I'm going to talk about today um, is about decision making and how do we end up, um, in a sense, improving informed decision making, improving the comprehension of information, but also the use of that information. Um, and I'll focus mostly on numbers. Uh, like Valerie, I'm a psychologist, um, so I often speak in experiments. I'll do that a little bit today. Uh, but I'm going to talk a bit about, um, first, um, what does it take to make a good decision? Um, and then uh, what are some of the evidence-based strategies um, for helping people to make better decisions or better use of information? And then finally, I'll talk a bit about some of the gaps, um, some of which I may mention a little along the way. To make a good decision, patients and consumers have to have information. That's kind of a very basic step. It has to be available. It has to be accurate. They have to get it at the right point in time. And oftentimes, um, healthcare providers end up thinking, that's it. Just provide it. That's enough. Um, but the patients don't even always attend to it. They don't, don't necessarily um, even look at the information all the time. And that, that attention to information is also quite important. Um, of course, we have to have more than that. They have to comprehend the information. And by comprehending the information, we, always, we often think about it as the precise information, the verbatim information, as Valerie pointed out. But people also have to be able to understand the meaning of that information. Because without meaning, without understanding the meaning of information, uh, that information doesn't end up getting used in decisions. Um, lots more happens to make good decisions, though. They have to be able to understand meaningful differences between various options, even if those various options are do I do it or not do it. Uh, they have to be able to weight um, the factors that are involved um, in order to match to their own needs and values. But that, of course, means that they have to be able to identify their needs and values in the moment. And that itself is a fairly difficult process. Um, they have to be able to make trade-offs, like between risks and benefits. I'll show you a little bit of data on, on, on risk information, at least. And then finally, they have to choose. And so just choosing ends up being this fairly complex cognitive process that requires some ability, because they have to be able to understand information and its meaning. They have to be able to make trade-offs. Um, and it also involves motivation. They have to care enough to want to bother. Um, I also, similar to, um, similar to Valerie, although we work off of somewhat different models, I, I, a lot of my research is based off of a dual process model of information processing, with the idea that people process information using two different modes of thought. One that's more experiential and affective and intuitive, the other is more deliberative and logical and analytical. Um, again, fairly similar to Valerie, I don't think about these as independent systems because they influence one another. How we feel ends up influencing what we think about just as what we think about ends up ultimately influencing how we feel about it. Um, and both of these processes end up being, uh, end up being important. What I'm going to talk about are different evidence-based communication techniques that are based in part on one or the other of these systems or the interaction of the systems. Um, and in fact, um, what I'm going to talk about in particular are five evidence-based strategies that come out of a, a paper um, that we did just recently. The Roundtable on Health Literacy at, at IOM recently commissioned us to do uh, to take a look at what are the implications of numeracy and in the, within the Affordable Care Act. And so we looked at the idea that people in the, um, who, are previous, who are currently uninsured but who will, be, who will be insured under the Affordable Care Act, what are they going to look like numeracy-wise? And what is that going to mean for communication? And how might we best communicate to people who are less numerate? Because people in the who are going to be insured under the, uh, under the Affordable Care Act will, in fact, um, a greater bulk of them are going to be less numerate, or are less numerate, excuse me. Um, but surprisingly, the first evidence-based strategy I want to talk about is that we should provide numbers. We should provide numeric information as opposed to not providing it. Um, and let me show you an example of that. It's going to be in prescription drugs. Um, prescription drugs have probabilistic side effects and benefits, but we rarely provide those probabilities. 
Um, so for example, um, if we're uh, prescription drugs like Prilosec, um, we get kind of a laundry list of different side effects if, we, if, we, if we're prescribed that drug and we go ahead and, and, and get that prescription filled. But we're often not told um, how likely the headaches are, how likely the dizziness is, how likely the rash is. We're instead given this nice little laundry list of things. And, and one of the questions is, is that laundry list enough for informed decision making, for a shared decision making kind of process? Um, and I'd like to suggest that perhaps it's not. Um, in particular, what we did is we did a, an internet study with about 900 folk. The median age was around 56 or so. Um, uh, and what we did is we presented them with, um, over the internet, we presented them with a hypothetical uh, prescription drug. Um, and it's basically modeled on statins. I simplified it a little bit because of experimental concerns. Um, and what we did is we had six different conditions that we randomly assigned across this, diff across this experiment to, it, to our respondents. Uh, the, the two conditions in red, the usual and the verbal, the usual is that laundry list that I showed you a moment ago. Um, but the two red conditions are non-numeric, and the four green conditions, we gave them the numbers, either in a frequency kind of format or in a percentage kind of format. And what I'm going to talk about now is just the comparison between the non-numeric in red and the, numeric, and the numeric formats in green. What you can see in general is that if you ask people, if you present them with this information, and the information's in front of them, um, whatever it is that excuse me, whatever the information is that, you, that, um, that, that you've given them. And then you ask them, okay, what, are the, what, what do you think are the numeric risks of this? Um, people in the numeric conditions have the numbers right there. And so go figure, people in the numeric condition mostly get it right. Um, these are the median risk estimates uh, in green. And the median risk estimate for each of the numeric formats, they got it right in terms of the median. Um, but in the two non-numeric formats, risks tend to be quite a bit overestimated. This replicates previous results. Um, the, a lot of other studies have shown that before. They've mostly been done in the European Union. Um, but, but that result and all of the prior studies end up concerning main effects only. What is, it, what is the difference if you present numbers or you don't present numbers? What we are interested in was, does the population matter? Because there's a lot of um, speculation out there that we shouldn't provide numbers to people who are less numerate because they can't handle it. They're not good enough with numbers, and so maybe we shouldn't be burdening them with numeric information. Um, because numer less numerate people um, might not be able to use it, they might not be able to work with them as well, they might respond to other information, other non-numeric sources of information. Because in general, that's what less numerate people do. We also had an interest in taking a look at aging effects. We had an interest in looking at how older adults might be different than younger adults in combination with numeracy kinds of concerns. Because older adults may find numeric risk information unfamiliar, they might find it more difficult. In general, older adults tend to be less numerate than younger adults are. Um, and they tend to be just sort of less flexible in their information processing. But with prescription drugs, it's, um, older adults are a really important population. About something on the order of 90% of older adults take at least one prescription drug. Whereas if you compare to younger adults, 20 to 59-year-olds, for example, it, more like half of them take at least one prescription, one prescription drug. And older adults are much more likely to be taking multiple prescription drugs. So these kinds of questions are actually very important with older adults. Um, so what we did is we, we took a look at um, the proportion of people, um, if they're given a numeric risk estimate, how likely are they to overestimate that risk with the idea that, that if you overestimate risk, you may be less willing to take the drug, you may be less willing to adhere, to get that prescription taken, to continue it over time. And in fact, kind of consistent with the speculation that less numerate people can't handle numeric information, the people who are less numerate, if they're given numbers, and these are only the people who are given numbers, the people who are less numerate, even though the information was right in front of them, they were actually much more likely to overestimate the risks um, uh, that we asked them about compared to the people who are more numerate. And so this suggests that maybe we shouldn't provide numeric information to people, particularly to people who are less numerate, except for one thing, we have a comparison. And that comparison is to the people who got the, the non-numeric conditions. Overestimating, overestimates of risk were much more common in the non-numeric formats, regardless of numeracy. And it's a substantial effect um, and a very robust effect. Um, in addition to that, we also did take a look at, uh, we asked people how likely were they to take the drug, uh, how, how, likely did, uh, how likely was it that they intended to take the drug, uh, if they were provided the numbers, and I'm showing you numeric as well as non-numeric information here. And so in terms of that likelihood to take the drug, that's what's on my y-axis here, 
um, people who are more numerate were more likely to take the drug. They're, essentially, they're, they're telling me I'm more likely to adhere if I gave them numbers compared to if I didn't give them numbers. And the question is, what happens with the people who are less numerate? The less numerate people are very similar. They show a little bit of a, 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 of a standard numeracy effect. They show a so somewhat smaller effect of numbers um, compared to the highly numerate, but they still show substantially the same effect as the highly numerate. And this suggests that um, providing numbers is, is a good thing within prescription drugs. It's allowing people um, to, to better understand. They understand the information better, but they're also using the information in ways that might promote adherence. Um, there are other evidence-based strategies. This, this, goes, this point goes back to Bill Lawrence's question before. Reducing, the co reducing cognitive effort is one of um, our best evidence-based strategies for increasing comprehension and use of information um, uh, in, in decision-making. Um, and requiring fewer inferences, doing the math for people. Um, there are lots of different things you can do to reduce cognitive effort. Um, you can provide fewer options. You can provide less information. Uh, there are studies that have been done on each of these. Um, don't expect people to understand cumulative risk is actually a very big point. Um, physicians will often, t um, if, they're if, if they're giving out numeric information, will provide the annual risk of something, the annual risk of, of, of some side effect from birth control, for example. But people often will take birth control for 10 years, 15 years. And so if they do that, that's the format in which the, in the cumulative risk should be presented because people are not good at all at understanding how risk accumulates over time. Um, use appropriate vi uh, visuals. There's evidence, for example, that pic uh, the use of pictographs, the use of little graphics, um, can reduce denominator neglect um, uh, within medical decision making. Um, there's another evidence-based strategy that targets, rather than targeting a more deliberative analytical mode of processing, targets the more experiential affective mode of processing. And this is the idea that we should be um, sometimes providing evaluative meaning, particularly when numeric information is unfamiliar to people, and they simply don't know how to evaluate it. Uh, let me show you one example of that. Um, one of the things that can be done is you can carefully use um, evaluative labels and symbols. And by carefully use, what I mean is you'd only want to pick situations where people are very unfamiliar with the context and unfamiliar with the kind of information you're giving them. We, we did a uh, series of studies at one point where we, where we were interested in um, people's use of quality of care information in judging hospitals and judging health insurance plans. And um, one of the things that we found was that this is the kind of information that people are very unfamiliar with. They don't make these kinds of decisions very often. Um, and when they do, they're not really sure how to evaluate the numeric information. Numbers are very difficult in these kinds of contexts. And in fact, when we gave people information on quality of care um, in a numbers only kind of format, similar to what I'm showing you here, people sim the, our, our respondents simply didn't use the numeric information or didn't use it very much. The people who are highly numerate were a little bit better about using the information. And so what we wanted to test, um, in the, uh, what we ended up, what we wanted to and ended up testing was the idea that, okay, here's, here we have a very unfamiliar situation where people don't know how to evaluate these kinds of numbers. What if we were to provide them with the meaning? What if we were to provide them with evaluative categories that help them to understand what were um, better um, numeric, what were better numbers when it came to that quality of care indicator or worse numbers when it came to that quality of care indicator? And what we were able to show across a series of studies <coughs> excuse me, um, is that it actually improved judgments. Um, people who are given the evaluative categories were better able to, to use that numeric quality of care information. Um, it also influenced choices. We can't say that it improved choices because we didn't have a better, in a, uh, a, 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 um, an objective better choice and worse choice, but it does influence choices. Um, and the other thing that we found in more sort of theoretical basic mechanism kinds of studies is that the, the reason that these evaluative categories seems to make a difference um, is because it seems to help people to access the affective meaning of the, of the um, in this case, a uh, uh, hospital quality of care indicator. Um, and that affective meaning seemed to be what helped them, um, it, it seemed to help guide their choices at that point. There are other things that you can do to provide evaluative meaning to increase information use, things like um, the use of frequency formats rather than percentage formats. So telling someone that a risk is 10 out of 100 instead of 10 percent out of 100. <laughs> that 10 out of 100 seems to um, increase the affective meaning of the information. People are more likely to picture that thing going wrong if you provide it in a frequency format. Whereas if you give them a percentage format, they report that, yeah, that's an abstract number, it's pretty low, and they don't tend to use the information as much. 
Here again, I say to carefully use this kind of information format change because you have to decide, the information provider at that point has to decide, what is it that I want patients to do? Do I want them to ignore this um, very uncommon but serious side effect? Or do I really want them to pay attention to this, this adverse event that might happen that they've been ignoring before? And so in these kinds of cases, um, you really have to think carefully about the ethical implications um, of using these kind of, this kind of evaluative meaning. Um, you can also use emotion to persuade. One of the um, best examples of that these days would be graphic warning labels coming out of the, coming out of the, uh, the FDA right now and being used around the world. I'm sorry, graphic warning labels for cigarettes, of course, for those of you who don't know that. Um, Another evidence-based strategy that, again, is um, based in the psychological mechanisms that seem to be important to judgment and choice is to use attention in order to guide people's use of information. There's a variety of different strategies that can be used. You can order information so that the most important information is first or it's last. Um, you can highlight the meaning um, through the use of evaluative categories or consumer reports kind of symbols, but you can highlight the meaning of only the most important information rather than all of the information, and that ends up um, ultimately making a difference to whether people use that most important piece of information or not. Um, you can use a framework to provide an overview of the information that's to come. There are some caveats on that if you're, if you're interested in that. There are some interesting findings uh, that were unexpected in that particular study. Um, you can also use fonts. You can use fonts that draw attention to important information so that you can make information, um, if you make information bolded um, or you make it disfluent, meaning it's a little bit harder to use, or you make it larger, um, people's attention is drawn more to that information. And you can show that um, people who are highly numerate and people who are less numerate end up being more sensitive to that information. Um, when, it's, when um, th those fonts are used to draw attention to the information. It seems to be the case that without using those kind of fonts to draw attention to important information, some people are simply just not really paying that much attention and they're not using it. And so if you know what the important information is, this is one of the techniques that can be used to increase the use of information. Um, the last of the evidence-based strategies is sort of a, um, a catch-all of other things um, that has to do with setting up the appropriate systems to to assist consumers and patients. And the first one of these is, in my view, the most important thing that we need to do in, dis uh, in terms of communication to, to consumers and patients. Um, Valerie's also mentioned this to some extent in her talk. And it's the idea that you have to identify the goals of the communication. Um, you have to identify exactly what it is that you think that patient or consumer needs to know. And then once you know that, then you can select information and options to present to patients that are consistent with the goal of that communication. You can use appropriate information presentation formats, again, that guide your patients and consumers towards the goals of that communication. But it all starts with understanding the goals in the first place. Um, there are a variety of important gaps, and I'll go ahead and start calling them research opportunities at this point, um, in the study of evidence-based communication. Um, one of the ones that we've looked at recently, and that I think is a very important and very understudied one, um, are starting to look at some of our more vulnerable and somewhat understudied populations, looking at interactions of age and numeracy, for example. Um, so we did, were actually able to show in the study that I presented earlier on prescription drugs, the less numerate older adults showed um, less benefit um, from the provision of numeric side effect information. And by benefit, um, benefit should be in quotations there. The benefit is whether um, they were reported being more likely to take the drug uh, versus not take the drug uh, when provided numbers versus, versus non-numeric information. That provision of numbers had less of an effect on the population where you might think it had less of an effect. We didn't try to target that very important and understudied population well enough to have a large enough sample size there. And I think it's actually an area of need within research because in healthcare, those, that, that's the, the older adults are our biggest consumers of healthcare. So I think this is an understudied area that really should be focused on more. Um, communication studies, and I am as much of, uh, much of a, a, someone who does this as anybody else, um, but we often focus on one or sometimes two attributes. Healthcare is a lot more complicated than that. What happens? What happens if we take a look at some of these same experimental kinds of manipulations? Um, do they have the same kinds of effects as, um, as happens in the, more, in the simpler situations uh, that we develop advice from? 
Um, risk communication techniques that have been studied experimentally have um, almost always been done so at a single time point. And yet, is that what patients face? Patients actually face decisions over time. They get information at one point in time from a physician and then from friends and family and then maybe from a nurse and then from somebody else. And they slowly over time um, come to a decision. Uh, the effects of our risk communication techniques are not as clear over time because they have not been studied as much. Um, one of the things that we've looked at recently is the idea that increasing shared decision making may have some unintended negative consequences under some circumstances or for some people. But this has not been looked at very much. And I think as we go forward, um, and, and, and I, I completely believe in shared decision making, I think we nonetheless need to understand some of the unintended consequences that happen, perhaps to people who are less vulnerable, um, less numerate populations, for example, older populations um, who are unaccustomed. Um, to, to taking on this role of, of sharing and decision making. What about oral communication? Certainly is done a lot in healthcare. We don't do as much in research. Um, what happens to information processing when someone's in poor health? It likely declines, um, but little research has been done looking at that explicitly. Um, one other thing is the new consumers and patients who are going to be insured under the Affordable Care Act, um, they are likely to be much less numerate. Uh, we estimated that about 29% of them Almost, almost a third of them are going to be at a below basic level of quantitative literacy. Not even below basic and basic. Both of those are considered at, um, some, uh, somewhat inadequate. But at a tw almost 30 percent of them are going to be at a below basic level of, of numeracy compared to about 18 percent of the currently insured population. Um, what are the implications of that? Are healthcare providers ready for that sort of communication with a population that is going to be less numerate? This is a question that one of the reviewers of my slides uh, pointed out, and I thought it was a very, very good point. Um, can we simplify, and I would actually say, how can we simplify information and options and still have an informed patient? That means we need to come up with a definition in a particular situation of what is an informed patient and make sure, therefore, once we've decided on what that definition is, what does it take to get there? Um, can, wh when, it, when have we simplified too much? and we've um, ended up uh, with a less informed patient than we'd prefer. If we can simplify and end up with an informed patient, how should ex experts choose to prioritize information? Um, how should they choose to prioritize options? Because maybe fewer options can be, shows, can be chosen. Um, how can experts make these kinds of choices in order to ultimately end up with the best informed consumers and patients? Um, Baruch Fishoff has a very nice paper in PNAS um, where he, he goes through the idea that this kind of process requires identifying those few scientific results that people need to know among the myriad scientific facts that it would be nice to know. We don't have to know everything in order to make a good informed choice. And then this actually goes to Eric's talk. I hadn't realized what you were going to speak about today. Um, how can we best teach people and disseminate how to do this? Um, to healthcare providers, um, through medical schools, nursing schools. And um, I, was, I loved your talk. I thought it was terrific, Eric. So in conclusion, consumers aren't particularly adept at using the complex information that's important to making good health decisions. People in this room know this. Um, we've seen a lot of evidence of this over time. Um, numeracy, or um, people's ability to do math in a sense, it influences how numeric and non-numeric facts are, pro are processed. Um, people who are more and less numerate walk away thinking that there are different facts, in fact. Um, and many individuals are innumerate. The ACA population is going to, um, is going to be a, a great example of that, where even more people are, le are innumerate. We do know a lot about evidence-based communication techniques. Um, careful use of those techniques can facilitate shared decision-making and informed, cons informed decision-making, but more research is needed. Things like um, hypothetical scenarios um, where experimental control can be ex um, exerted uh, so we can understand the causal effects of what it is that we're studying. But we also, of course, need to know more in real health situations where health outcomes and disparities can be understood. And I wanted to end with a point that I thought Valerie actually also made very well, that an understanding of psychological mechanism in the end is key. Um, it's key to developing general principles in order to guide how should we be communicating with, communicating with patients, and also how do we need to set up these appropriate systems to assist them.